Well, good morning, Pathway Church family, and good morning to all of you moms. Today is Mother's Day, and we are so glad that we can honor and celebrate you this morning together. I invite all of you, if you would, at this time, just to bow with me for a word of prayer before we open up God's Word. Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to learn, uh, to allow you to minister and uh, just meet us where we're at. Lord, on this particular Sunday, we thank you for the mother that you've given to each and every one of us. A mom who uh, has so impacted our lives in so many ways, has influenced us more than just about anybody on the face of this earth. And Lord, we thank you for our moms. It's unfortunately something we don't say enough, but we do thank you for them. And we ask that you would just encourage each of our moms today. Have your way as we open up your word now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Moms, uh, you guys have an incredibly challenging job, to put it mildly. I came across a, a job description of a mother, and I wanted to share it with you as we begin our time together. The job description goes like this. Long-term team player needed for challenging permanent work in an often chaotic environment. Candidates must possess excellent communication and organizational skills and be willing to work variable hours, which will include evenings, weekends, and frequent 24-hour shifts on call. Some overnight travel is required, including trips to primitive camping sites on rainy weekends and endless sports tournaments in faraway cities. Travel expenses are not reimbursed. Extensive courier duties also required. What are the responsibilities that come with the job? Well, for starters, it's for the rest of your life. You must be willing to be hated at least temporarily until someone needs $5. You must be willing to bite your tongue repeatedly must also be willing to possess the physical stamina of a pack mule and be able to go from zero to 60 miles per hour and three seconds flat in case this time the screams from the backyard are not someone just crying wolf. You must be willing to face stimulating technical challenges such as small gadget repair, mysteriously sluggish toilets, and stuck zippers. You must screen phone calls and maintain calendars and coordinate production of multiple homework projects. You must have the ability to plan and organize social gatherings for clients of all ages and mental outlooks. You must be willing to be indispensable one minute and embarrassment the next. You must handle assembly and product safety testing of a half a million cheap plastic toys and battery operated devices. You must always hope for the best and be prepared for the worst. You must assume final and complete accountability for the quality of the end product. Responsibilities also include floor maintenance and janitorial work throughout the facility. As far as possibility for advancement and promotion with this job, there is virtually none. Your job is to remain the same position for years without complaining, constantly retaining and updating your skills so that those in your charge can ultimately surpass you. Don't be worried about previous experience. There is none required. On-the-job training will be offered continually throughout the duration. As far as wages and compensation with this job, get this. You pay them. Offering frequent raises and bonuses. A balloon payment is due when they turn 18 years old because of the assumption that college will help them become more financially independent. And when you die, you give them whatever's left. The oddest thing is that this reverse salary scheme is that you actually enjoy it and you wish you could only do more. Benefits? While no health or dental insurance, no pension, no tuition reimbursement, 
no paid holidays, and no stock options are offered, this job supplies limitless opportunity for personal growth and lots of free hugs and kisses throughout your lifetime. Moms, there's no doubt you have an incredibly daunting task day in and day out. It's funny too, because as you take on and assume the role of a mom, throughout the life of a child, their opinion of their mother changes. Listen to this, at the age of four, a child says, my mommy can do anything. By the age of eight, my mommy knows a whole lot. The age of 12, my mother doesn't really know quite everything. By 14, naturally, mommy doesn't know that either. At the age of 16, mother, she's hopelessly old fashioned. Age 18, the old woman, she's way out of date. By the age of 35, before we decide, let's get mom's opinion. Age 45, I wonder what mom would have thought about it. And at the age of 65, I wish I could talk it over with my mom. Moms, not only is your job daunting, but oftentimes you go very much underappreciated by your children. Their opinion of you changes over time. You go from being an absolute moron to a genius by the time your kids grow up and out of the house. This morning, I want us to look at the life of a mom. A mom that we read about in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, and we're gonna look in to chapter two, verses one through 11 today. But as we get ready to go there, I wanna give you a little bit of a history as to what the circumstances and situation were at that particular time when the arrival of this child were to come into this house. The Israelites were in Egypt. They were in bondage. And one of the pharaohs came into power he was a new king, and as he observed and looked around, he simply realized one truth, and that was this, that the Israelites were actually growing in numbers at a faster rate than the Egyptians, and that if war would ever break out and the Israelites chose to side and align themselves with the enemy, they would by far outnumber the Egyptians. And so this new pharaoh, this new king, wanted to curtail the growth of the Israelite population. And so in order to do that, what he chose to do was to go to the masters, the Egyptian masters, and to tell them to step up the oppression as the Israelites served doing hard labor. Now normally, typically, they find that when people are heavily oppressed, it actually slows down growth population. However, they kind of forgot about the fact that there's this other part of the equation they left out, and that is God. And in the midst of this incredibly oppressive time in the lives of the Israelites, their numbers didn't decrease, they actually increased exponentially. And so this new Pharaoh's plan was foiled. So he went on to plan B. And what plan B involved was going and taking two chief midwives, Hebrew midwives, and telling them clearly his plan. And here's the plan that they were supposed to share with the other midwives, that whenever a Hebrew woman would go into labor, if she was giving birth to a son, they were to kill that child. If it was a girl, fine, let her live. The thought was over time, all the boys, uh, Israelite boys would die off, and the Israelite girls would marry Egyptians and bear Egyptian children, and basically it would become nothing but Egyptians and no Israelites. However, the scripture tells us that these, these midwives feared God. In other words, they were gonna obey God and do what God wanted them to do long before they were ever gonna follow through with what Pharaoh was asking them to do. And so, 
As these little boys were born into Israelite homes, the midwives did nothing, and the population continued to grow. When Pharaoh caught word of this, he called the midwives in. He says, what's going on? And they said, it's these women, these Hebrew women are going into labor so quickly. By the, by the time we arrive, the children are already born. There's nothing we could do. Plan B, foiled. The Israelite population kept growing. So Pharaoh went to plan C. This time, he bent the ear of the Egyptians as well. And he said this, that if a Hebrew boy is born, I want you to participate. I want you to take that child. I want you to throw that child into the Nile River and allow for him then to drown. And that way, we can curtail the population growth. And so that was the edict that went out. All the Israelites and all the Egyptians were fully aware that what Pharaoh wanted was for these Hebrew boys, these baby boys, to be cast into the Nile River and killed that way. It's under those circumstances that we find ourselves in our text this morning, reading about a man and a woman who were welcoming into their home their third child. They had a daughter, the oldest, the firstborn. Her name was Miriam. And then three years prior to their third child being born, they had had another son. His name was Aaron. We know this baby. His name is Moses. He's a key figure in Scripture. And we pick up in Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verses 1 and 2. Now, a man from the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. We're not actually told the name of this child's parents. That wasn't the important part. The important thing was that they were Levites, both of them. They were descendants of Abraham. In fact, the father was the sixth generation from Abraham. Later on in the same book, Exodus chapter 6, verse 20, we do find out the name of the parents finally. The father's name was Amron, and the mother's name was Jochebed. Amron and Jochebed were welcoming their third child into the world we see here. And we're told that she saw that he was a fine child. There's a lot of debate as to what this term means. A fine child could have meant that he was a healthy child. That's how some commentators have interpreted it. Or some that he was exceptionally good looking, a good looking child. Uh, whatever the case may be, there was something noticeable about this child. And this child was someone that God had obviously put his finger upon. And we'll see that as our text plays out here today. What we see here, though, is a mother's faith being played out. She was a woman who obviously loved God, a woman who depended upon God, and a woman who, even under these very difficult circumstances, when she saw that child, determined in her heart that she was not going to do what Pharaoh initially had told them to do, throw the baby in the river, but instead she was going to hide this baby. And we're told that she did that for three months. In Hebrews chapter 11, a chapter that is known as the Hall of Faith, we have a number of accounts of different people throughout Scripture who demonstrated remarkable faith. And in the 11th chapter, verse 23, we read these words, By faith... Moses' parents hid him for three months after he, had, he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Moses' parents were parents of faith. They were parents who trusted in God and demonstrated their faith in God by taking and hiding this child for those three months. From first sight, Moses, we're told, was viewed as no ordinary child. 
It was evident to them that God had a special purpose for this boy. And so his parents, they defied Pharaoh's edict initially, and they kept him alive in their home, hidden. Now keep in mind, that was no small task. If you've had a child, you understand children, yes, while cute and adorable, and oftentimes are quiet because they're sleeping, when things aren't all okay, they can let it be known that there's a problem. And keeping that cry under wraps can be challenging at times. Especially when you are aware that there are a bunch of Egyptian spies who are wandering about and they're very tuned in to the cry of a child or the sight of a child because they know that Pharaoh had given clear direction. Any Israelite baby boy was to be thrown into the river. And so with all those spies out and about, what, what Moses' parents were doing was challenging. His death sentence, though, this death sentence that Pharaoh had made an edict was no match for God. Well, it became increasingly more and more difficult for his mom and dad to keep their baby son. But this is when we see a second trait of Moses' mom. She was a mother who loved her son. That love was evident in the way she protected him and cared for him. And we pick up in verses 3 and 4, and it says, But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Jacobet did everything she could do as a mom up until the last minute and then she realized I can't keep doing this and so she at that point literally allowed for God's providence to take over she entrusted her child very much so to God completely how do we know that well we're told that she went and she got a papyrus basket Maybe a wicker basket is how we could talk about it. And, and she coated that thing with tar and pitch. She made that basket watertight. And then, and only then, she put that precious cargo, her baby son, into that basket. And strategically placed it there, we're told, along the bank of the Nile amongst the reeds. And then this baby's older sister, Miriam, stood and watched to see what would happen Maybe she was going to give a report to her mom. It's interesting, this basket that Jochebed placed her baby in is the same word that's used elsewhere in Scripture. Back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. It's the account of a man by the name of Noah. He was living at a time when our world was a world that was very corrupt and violent. And God looked down and he saw what was going on. And he said, that's it, enough. I'm going to destroy the earth and the people in it. And so he called upon Noah to build an ark. And in chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 14, it says, So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. It's interesting, in Genesis' account, this boat or ark that Noah would build would carry upon it not just the animals of the world, but Noah's family. And God preserved Noah and his family to basically be a savior, in a sense, to the human race. They would repopulate the world. But here in Exodus chapter 2, the very same thing was happening. This little boy that was placed in this basket very much was one that God would preserve and watch over because God had a very clear purpose for this young man's life. He would grow up himself to also become a savior for the people of Israel. He would be the one that God would use to ultimately lead them out of Israel 
and the bondage of slavery there in Egypt and take them to the land that God had promised his people, Israel. So we see this unbelievable love that a mother has for her child. How she sought to protect him and to care for him and to provide for him. And even up to this point, she did everything she possibly could. She trusted that God would take care of her baby. And God surely did not disappoint her. Let me just take a moment right now to encourage all Christian parents, but specifically this morning, to encourage all Christian moms. Like Moses' parents and like Moses' mom, you can take and entrust your children to God, that he will watch over them and guide them and direct them. I mean, we can do all that we can do while our kids are home and then they kind of branch off, whether that means going off to work and live away from you or go off to school. And there is an element of almost feeling somewhat helpless because you're not there watching and observing them and having the opportunity to physically love them and hug them and kiss them like you did before. But what great, great encouragement is found in knowing that God loves our children even more than we do. And God is with them, even though we're not. Well, let's continue in our text to see how God works in this particular situation with this child now that is in a basket amongst reeds along the banks of the Nile River. And we pick up there in verses 5 through 9. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket along, uh, among the reeds, and she sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is a Hebrew's baby, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. What an incredible thing. Marion, as she's watching, she's noticing that this basket containing her baby brother has now been noticed by Pharaoh's daughter of all people. The very one who had given the edict to eliminate the children of the Hebrews, the boys. She goes down to the Nile River to bathe. I'm sure this was a common thing for her to do. Her attendants are with her and they notice this basket. As they draw near to the basket and open it, there's this crying infant in this basket. And as that baby is shedding tears, God uses those tears of a baby to prick the very heart. And they're compassionate to this baby. Pharaoh's daughter is compassionate towards this baby, even though she knows it's a Hebrew baby. Not only is the life of this baby Moses saved, but you've got to love how it plays out here. Miriam is, is close by, and she says to Pharaoh's daughter, Would you like for me to go seek someone out who can nurse him and care for him for you? And not only does Pharaoh's daughter say yes, but Miriam then goes to her own mom, the mother of Moses, and the baby and the mother are reunited once again. Mom can care for him and feed him. And at the same time, Pharaoh's daughter is going to pay her to do this at the same time. You talk about God orchestrating things, providing in every sense of the word, for Moses and his family. I'm reminded of the words in Romans chapter 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. The very nature of God's deliverance is sometimes surprising. It's sometimes very unexpected. 
But God was at work. And he was preparing something incredibly special. He was creating the deliverer for Israel from Egypt. But let's not just think that when Moses was brought back to his place of origin, his home of origin, and reunited with his mother, Jochebed, that she was just simply feeding him and taking care of his physical needs. No, there was a lot more going on. In fact, people will tell you that the early years in the life of a child are its most formative years. That social adjustment tremendously is impacted in those early years. That emotional adjustments are huge during that time. Mentally, they're developing. And let's not forget the most important, spiritually. His mother was pouring into his life. She was teaching him about the true God during this time. And it would appear that, that Moses was probably reunited with his mom so that the first two to three years of his life his mom and dad, his siblings, were pouring into his life. These were critical days of development in his life. Which leads us to the third point, and that's a mother's influence. A mother's influence. Jacobed had a huge impact on Moses' life. She poured into him. And while she may not have seen initially the payoff, in time, it would be seen for what it really truly was. In verses 10 and 11, we're told, when the child grew older, again, probably close to the age of three, Jacobed took her son to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She adopted him as her own child, and she gave him the name Moses, saying, I drew him up out of the water. Well, now we catapult ourselves down the road many, many years. Close to 40 years go by. And we pick up in verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out where his own people were. And he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. And you know the story. Moses jumped in, he ended up killing that guard, and because of fear that it was found out, he bolted and went out into the desert, out into the wilderness, and it was there that God would prepare him for another almost 40 years before he would send him back to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel out of their bondage. But how is it that Moses knew he was a Hebrew? How was it that he identified? I mean, think about this. When he was adopted into Pharaoh's home by Pharaoh's daughter as her very own son, he all of a sudden was thrust into the highest of educations available. He experienced and had great privileges that very, very few at that time would have had. He received the highest educational uh, education available. And yet when he became an adult, and he observed the behavior of this Egyptian striking and beating a Hebrew. It did something down in his spirit, and it catapulted him into action. I believe that he identified with the Hebrew because of the impact and the influence his mother had on his life early on. And it was the Israelites that Moses ultimately chose to identify himself with. It's a pretty amazing story when you stop and you think about it. Here's a guy who literally had everything money could buy and then some. He was a part of the royal family of Pharaoh. And yet, when it came down to it, that didn't matter to Moses. What mattered to him was his very own people and standing for what is right is God. Moms, don't ever underestimate the impact and influence you have on your children. I know there are days you probably scratch your head and wonder 
based on things they say and actions they take. Is anything that I'm saying, is anything that I'm modeling for them taking root in their life? It may not be until years later that you really see the payoff. But stay the course. There is nobody. I'm not saying there aren't other influences in your child's life in the form of other people. But there is no one who pours into the lives of a child more, typically, than a mom. And I want you to know that the faith of a child oftentimes grows stronger when it's tested. And we see that played out here with the life of Moses. I think oftentimes the role of a mom is a very thankless job. I think very few people understand what a mom goes through other than other mothers. I, I came across this little article entitled Myths of Motherhood. I wanted to share with you as we kind of wind down our time today on this Mother's Day 2020. It goes like this. Somebody said that a child is carried in its mother's womb for nine months. Somebody does not know that a child is carried in its mother's heart forever. Somebody said it takes about six weeks to get back to normal after you've had a baby. Somebody doesn't know that once you're a mother, normal is history. Somebody said that you learn how to be a mother by instinct. Somebody never took a three-year-old shopping. Somebody said being a mother is boring. Somebody never rode in a car driven by a teenager with a driver's permit. Somebody said, good mothers never raise their voices. Somebody never came out of the back door just in time to see her child hit a golf ball through the neighbor's kitchen window. Somebody said, you don't need an education to be a mother. Somebody never helped a fourth grader with his math. Somebody said, you can't love the fifth child as much as the first. Somebody doesn't have children. Somebody said a mother can find all the answers to her child-rearing questions in the, book, in, in the books. Somebody never had a child stuff beans up her nose. Somebody said the hardest part of being a mother is labor and delivery. Somebody never watched her baby get on a school bus for the first day of kindergarten. Somebody said a mother can stop worrying after her child gets married. Somebody doesn't know that marriage adds a new son or daughter-in-law to the mother's heartstrings. Somebody said a mother's job is done when her last child leaves home. Somebody never had grandchildren. Somebody said your mother knows you love her, so you don't need to tell her. Somebody isn't a mother. I hope, if you have the opportunity today, that you take the time to let your mother know truly how much you love her. You can send a card, but there's nothing like her hearing you tell her how much you love her. Moms, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for the investment your life is in the lives of the children that God has blessed you with. And thank you for being a blessing to your children, even though they may not recognize it quite yet. I hope that you have a blessed Mother's Day. And I'd like to close in prayer by praying for you this morning. Our Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for blessing each home with a mom. I thank you for the reality that none of us would be here had it not been for our mothers. I, I thank you for Christian moms who, first of all, love Jesus Christ first and foremost, and who seek and strive to live their lives to honor and please him. And in the process, Lord, model for us what it means to know and follow after Jesus Christ. But I thank you 
for the truth that they take a hold of and apply in their own life and then pass on to their children. I thank you for the lasting impressions that are made by moms. Sometimes impressions that won't reveal themselves until years later, maybe even until their children become adults. But thank you. And so I pray for young moms right now, Lord, that you would encourage them, that they wouldn't give up, that you would give them the, the strength to persevere and stay the course and know that there is a day coming when they will see the investment paid off. Lord, I pray for moms whose children are no longer at home. I thank you for their lives. And the reality is they continue to invest in their children, just in maybe different ways. I pray that you would just bless each and every one of our moms today. I thank you for them. I pray that they would feel celebrated and honored. And Lord, I thank you for the richness of a mom, a mom who loves you and whose love for our family is very evident. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.